Good morning once again, and welcome to the Baptist Voice. We're glad that you've tuned in this morning. If this is your first time listening to the Baptist Voice, we would encourage you to listen every Sunday morning. You can also go to our YouTube channel, which is under Pastor Joseph Hart, H-A-R-T, and there you can find the programs that are preached from the Baptist Voice in audio form, and perhaps you can forward them to your friends, your loved ones, your neighbors, or just someone in general that you may feel the message can be an encouragement to, and also you can find the messages that are preached from the pulpit of the Bible Baptist Church located in Greendale, Indiana, just outside of the greater Cincinnati, northern Kentucky area. As soon as you come into Indiana, we are right there. I mean, we're not two minutes into Indiana, right off of I-275. Well, we're glad to be with you. Again, we thank the Lord for the opportunity. We always count a privilege to be able to do work and labor for our great King. And today, I want to try to help with would perhaps be, and at least it should be, uh, some of the greatest thoughts and questions that a human being should have in their life. And that would be the path, the presence, and the pleasures of this life. How do we obtain direction to the path? What type of presence should we abide in and truly Where is the pleasures of this life found at? And with that in mind, I want to turn to a Psalm of David, chapter number 16, and we want to look at verse number 11. Psalms chapter 16, verse number 11. And while you're getting your King James Bible, I want to just make mention, if you and your family do not currently have a church home, I would encourage you to come and visit with us here at the Bible Baptist Church this morning. As our announcement was made just a little bit ago, 11 o'clock, we'll be meeting for preaching, uh, 10 o'clock, Sunday school, which is fully graded, and then Sunday evening tonight, we'll be assembling together at 6.30, Our midweek service, very important service every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and then just different things that take place with revival meetings and from time to time youth meetings and special occasions, and we just want you to know that you're welcomed, and if you do not have a church home, if you don't have a pastor, someone who's praying for you, someone who's studying the Word of God and trying to enrich in your life with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. If you don't have that type of leadership in your life, I would just encourage you to really think about that. It's, I think it's it's God's design. There's no doubt about that because the Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, and he gave some pastors. And the word pastor, it literally means in the biblical sense, he's an under shepherd. He's one that shepherds people, and people are referred to as sheep. Some people are referred to as goats. There is a difference. But people in general need shepherding. And Jesus Christ is the great shepherd, and he calls men and he equips men to shepherd his people in his absence by his spirit and by his word. So if you do not have that currently in the life of yourself and your family and your children, I want to encourage you to really think about that. Just Give that some consideration this morning. And I don't know why the Lord would lay such on my heart this morning in that particular area, because it's not part of our message, but I pray that that would be an encouragement to you in whatever way the Lord would have that to be. Now, I'm not going to read the entire Psalms of chapter number 16. I don't think I need to uh, for the verse that we're going to use. We don't need to give the reference of the background of what's going on. It's just, it's one of them principles that just, It's easy to understand, it's easy to conceive, but yet it is fundamentally of vital importance in our life to play out. Verse number 11, thou, now that thou is a reference to God, thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Now, there's three words in this particular verse that ought to be underlined in your Bible. Number one, path. Uh, Number two, present or presence. Excuse me, presence. And number three, pleasures. The word path, the word presence, and the word pleasures. The delightment of life, where is it found at? 
when we talk about living the good life, people will ask me regularly, how are you doing, Pastor? And I said, look, I'm doing great. And I always give an explanation of why I say that. God is good to me and God takes care of me. I just don't say I'm great. There's a reason for that. If you're doing bad, there's a reason behind that. Now, sometimes you don't want to share them reasons with people, do you? No, you don't because you say it's personal. And as a pastor, people trust in me and they confide in me a lot. And people will tell me, you know, say, Pastor, I, I want to get something off my heart. I want to talk to you about something. Um, is this going to go anywhere else? Can I trust you? And I say, yes, you can. And it'll never go anywhere else, regardless of who asked me, from the President of the United States of America until all the men in the world together, if somebody asked me not to repeat something and say something, it stays within my mind and it dies there when I leave. But people, most of the time, when they have a problem, they don't share it. But yet, cannot we see problems on the individual's face and maybe hear them in their words? And cannot we see them sometimes in their actions? Yes, we can, because problems start in the heart, and the heart has a lot of influence and a lot of control over the way we act, the way we activate our lives, whether it's talking, acting, living, thinking. And yet, once again, there are some people, you know, I would, on a daily basis, how is your day going? They say, oh, it's going good. And I will say something like this, oh, I know why. And they'll look at me, sometimes a little puzzled, most of the time. They'll say, why? I say, because you're trusting in the same God that I'm trusting in. And this morning, you got up and you thanked him. And you're walking with him. And he's showing you the path of life. You're walking and living in his presence. And you're enjoying this life. And you know there's a life to come. And a lot of times, people say, you know what? You're you're right. I didn't get up this morning and thank God, but I should have. Because you know what? At the end of the day, he's good to me. And then just, uh, this is an everyday occurrence. This isn't every now and this is every day. I mean, just the other day, somebody told me, they said, you know, I've found in my life that God's really the only one that'll listen to me. And he's the only one that understands. And I said, you are 100% accurate. But the delightment of life, uh, where is it found at? Is it found by occupying a certain course in life? I believe there's truth in that. Is it found in the presence of wisdom, in the presence of evil, in the presence of righteousness? Is it found in the presence of self-contained wisdom? Maybe it's found in pleasures. Is, is the delightment of life found in pleasures? Is it, isn't it interesting? I have found with pleasures, as I have studied my life and looked at my life, and I view the lives of other people over the years, that have been around me and in our ministry and friends that minister, that pleasures have a tendency to change for people who are really not walking with God. They go from one pleasure, they get up on it, they like it, it dies off. They go to another pleasure, they get up on it, they like it, it goes off. They go to another pleasure, they get up on it, they like it, they go off. They go to another, and this is a round of life that they deal with. But yet I find Dedicated Christians simplifying their life and keeping their pleasure in a very tight circle. As as for me, I'll, I'll tell you what I, the pleasures of my life. Uh, first and foremost, um, I, I I love God. I I love God. I have pleasure in that. I mean, um, I just I appreciate what He does. There's pleasure for me in my life to know that God is in my life, and then my family, and my fa- and I'm like you. Sometimes family moments aren't pleasant, but you know, we don't let them override the pleasant times, do we? No, we're not, we're not ignorant of a device there that can harm us and destroy our family relationship. Although sometimes our relationships and our family are not pleasant, we still exercise pleasure over them particular unpleasant situations to gain wisdom and understanding. And, uh, you know, my family being with my family, being with my church family, I have a lot of pleasure. You know, I'm like, I am, and I mean this. I'm like David. And David said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I get up every Sunday morning early, and I I love, and I look forward to going to church. I got a lot on my mind, and I look forward to Sunday school, and I look forward to seeing people. And if I don't see people, I do truly miss them. And then I look forward to preaching the word of God. And 
I look forward to preaching Sunday evening the Word of God, and I look forward to uh, singing and listening to the singing and listening to the prayers, and I look forward to the giving that takes place in church, and I look forward to Wednesday night. I really do. I look forward to Wednesday night. I have pleasure in that. I'm I'm glad, as David said, I was glad when he said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And then, you know, I have a few other small hobbies. Uh, I'd suppose my number one hobby would be I'm an outdoorsman. Um, I love the outdoors. I am 53 years old. I've been in the outdoors all my life, all of my life. My uncle was a professional trapper, and I started tagging with him at eight, nine years old, and he uh, handed me over to his mentor, which was one of the greatest trappers and one of the greatest bow hunters this world has ever known. By the time 1995 came around, the man had shot more white-tailed deer with a bow and arrow than any man probably in America. I mean, just a just a, a mentor to me, a, 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 a World War II hero, and, um, you know, he taught me a lot about the woods, and I really enjoy bow hunting. I There's something about being God's creation and bow hunting and, and teaching people about it and letting them get involved in it. It's very, it's very dear to me. I enjoy that. And then I enjoy some hobbies like mechanics, uh, but I'm not no expert there. So there are pleasures in life, but is that the whole delight of life? Well, if you'll remember, we're reading... This verse, chapter number 16 of the book of Psalms, verse 11, is written by King David. And you'll know King David had a son by the name of Solomon. Now, Solomon was the greatest king that's ever lived on this earth. Solomon's kingdom and its height exceeded anything we would ever know. History won't really tell you all this, but if you read the history of the Bible, sometimes secular history, no doubt, denies the history of the Bible. And the Bible history is true. It just can't be... It cannot be proven wrong. The Bible, the King James Bible cannot be proven wrong. It cannot be, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I know in your mind you may be spinning around there saying, well, that's easy to refute. It's wrote by a bunch of men. Uh, It's wrote by holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, Peter says. There's a great difference in a man speaking than a holy man of God spake as he was moved by the Holy Spirit. You you can speak by being moved by people. I mean, your neighbor comes over to you, um, and uh, let's just say they take four or five eggs and they throw them against your brand new car. Well, that neighbor can provoke you to speak. <laughs> I mean, it may not be good. What if that neighbor says, hey, neighbor, you get you a brand new, nice four by four, four door Dodge truck or a Ford truck. And your neighbor comes over to you and says, I want you to come over and see what I got, you know, and you go over there and you say, wow, that's nice. And you pull out your pocket knife out of your pocket and you say, hey, can I do watch this? And you go from the front fender with your pocket knife all the way down to the rear and you put a gouge in it. You're going to influence your neighbor to say some things, and they're probably not going to be good. Matter of fact, I don't know. He may not say nothing with his words. He may grab a hold of you and beat you half to death. I don't know. This is just an illustration purpose, but what I'm getting at is as people can influence you to speak, God has influenced his men to speak. Understand that. When we're talking about the King James Bible, we're talking about the Word of God. Now, Solomon Although he was the wisest man that ever walked on this earth, the greatest man of stature that ever lived on this earth. You know what Solomon's yearly income was just in gold? His yearly income in one year in just gold. I'm not talking about in silver and in bronze and in precious jewels like emeralds, diamonds. I'm not talking about that. Just his set standard salary in gold once a year. And Solomon reigned for 40 years was $1 billion one hundred and twenty-five million eighty-seven thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars in our day and age of money exchange. When you look at the um, the talents that Solomon received in one year, which were about six hundred and sixty-six talents of gold in one year, it equivalents to today about one billion one hundred and twenty-five million eighty-seven thousand eight hundred and eighty-eight dollars and zero cents. That's just in one year, and he reigned, take that times 40. <laughs> We're talking, again, about the greatest, perhaps, man that there's ever been. But let me, let's look into his life a little bit about delightment. Let's listen to what the wisest man in the world said about delightment. Now, here's what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. 
I said in mine heart, now he's talking to himself, go to now, I will prove thee with myrrh, therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. Of myrrh, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly till I might see what, excuse me, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. So Solomon is saying, I embarked on a journey to check out everything and to do everything to see what was really good for the sons of men. And he goes on in verse four and he says, I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. I planted trees and them of all kinds of fruit. I made me pools of water to water wherewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me, meaning these things to this particular point in life didn't drive him mad like wealth and riches do so many people. Now listen, verse 10. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, All was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath already been done? Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. That's death. We all die. Then said I in my heart, as it has happened to the fool, so has it happened even to me. And why was I more the wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man as the fool? Now listen to verse 17. Therefore, I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. For all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that should be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? And his sons were foolish. Yet shall I have rule over all my, excuse me, yet shall he, have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. Therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity. Yet to a man that hath not labored, therein shall he leave it for his portion. This also is vanity and a great evil. For what hath man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart wherein he hath labored under the sun. For all his days are sorrows, and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw, that it was the hand of God. For who can eat 
Or who else can hasten un, uh, hither unto more than I? Because he had the ability to do anything Solomon did. No man had the privilege like he did in his life. He says in verse 26, and we'll conclude, For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Now, in Ecclesiastes chapter number two, Solomon is telling us that he got everything in the world that his heart wanted. And as he looked over it all of what it meant and what it brought in the regards to the delight of life, he says in verse 17, therefore, I hated life. Now, he hated it because the work under the sun was grievous and it was vanity and vexation. He brings nothing in this world. He takes nothing out of this world. But there's another truth here of what he is saying, that his delight was not in gold and silver and his big gardens and all of his houses and all of his vineyards and all the trees that he had planted and all the pools of water that he had and all of his servants and his maidens and his army and his great possessions of cattle, hundreds of thousands of cattle and hundreds of thousands of sheep and hundreds of thousands of this and, and particular treasures of kings of the provinces and all of his singer, a choir of 20,000 and a choir of 15,000 special singers, musical instruments. He said, I was great and I increased more and more. My wisdom retained with me. And his wisdom, he found that life does not delight in the consistency of the things or the abundance of what a man has, but it must be therefore in something else. And that something else is God. That something else is God. What can God show you? What can God show you in your particular life? Well, the psalmist, again, let's get into our verse. Thou wilt show me the path of life. First of all, there is a path of life for you. You're born for a reason, my dear friend. Your life is of great value and significance to God, your creator. The way or the course of life is what's spoken of here. The way you conduct your life, the course that you take upon. Jesus said, to all of us in John chapter 14 concerning this this way, this course, this path of life. In chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus says he is the way. There's a right way in life that we would glean from our own wisdom and knowledge. There's a wrong way in life that we as well glean from our own ways and knowledge. And then there's God's way in consideration of why he's created you and why you exist. And if you are apart from God, you'll never know the path of your life. If you do not choose to make up your mind and live for God, you'll never know the path of life. Now, you may be a Christian this morning, but you may be far away from God and not walking in his ways. You think you're in the right way. Maybe you know you're in the wrong way. Maybe you know you're not in God's way. See, I thought at one time I was doing pretty good, but it wasn't God's way. It wasn't best. It was second best. There is the path of life. Now, that's where this all starts at, and it starts with trusting and putting our faith and our confidence in God's Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus died for our sin on the cross. He was buried in a grave, and on the third day, Jesus Christ rose again from the grave so he could conquer death, my and your greatest enemy. And those that believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, have eternal life. Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Paul said that he has finished, he had finished his course. He has ran his race. You have a course to run for God, your care. God has made you and created you for a certain way to live, for a certain course of life. You have fulfillment and significance in your life for God. Now listen. Don't allow the devil, your enemy, Satan, to veer you away from that. Secondly, there is the presence of the Lord. He goes on and says, in thy presence is fullness of joy. The presence of the Lord. What is joy? Joy is a delight of the mind from the consideration of the present or assured approaching possession of a good. So joy in life is knowing that you possess something that is good and you're sure that that is going to bring something into your life and it maintains a confidence in your life. Now, in this world, ladies and gentlemen, 
from a Bible standpoint, because I'm a Bible preacher, I'm a biblical preacher. I'm not a, uh, a I'm a biblical preacher. I, I rightly divide and I preach the word of God, the Bible. I'm not here to entertain you, and I don't pastor a church that's here to entertain you. I'm not interested in entertainment. But the fact of the matter is, biblically speaking, there are only two types of presence operating in this world. There is God's presence, which we call the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of the Lord, or the Spirit of God, or the Holy Ghost. There is God's presence. He is referred to as the comforter. He is the glorifier of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit's presence works in our life. Then there is the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist. Now, the person, the Antichrist, is going to come soon. He's going to show up on this world, and he is going to conduct and shape a one-world revived-type Roman Empire. And we're there, friend. A mark of the beast. We're, we're there. We are there. The Antichrist is not here, but the spirit of the Antichrist. And the spirit of the Antichrist works against Bible preaching, works against Jesus Christ. The spirit of the Antichrist believes in Jesus Christ, but does not believe that he is God. The spirit of the Antichrist will not admit to you. So when a person says they're a Christian or a person says they are a, a believer in God and they say that Jesus Christ is not God, that is the spirit of the Antichrist. That is a liar. That is somebody you need to get away from. You need to get away from that individual. Jesus Christ, the Bible clearly teaches, is God. And it's called the mystery of godliness that God was justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. God took human flesh in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to communicate to humanity a message that humanity could embrace. If he had not done that, God cannot communicate to you and I because he's so much higher than you and I. Jesus Christ is God. Now, the spirit of the Antichrist will say, you don't need church. The spirit of the Antichrist will say, you're doing fine in life. You got all the money you could want. The spirit of the Antichrist will lie to you, deceive you, fool you, that's his goal. That's his job. The presence of the Lord, though, is where joy is at. Listen, in thy presence is fullness of joy. In the presence of God. And then he says, at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. We're talking about pleasures forevermore, not pleasures that last for six months, not a relationship that lasts for two months or two years and then out of it, divorce, another one, divorce, another one, divorce. Not that. Pleasure is found in all kinds of areas of life. And he says here, at thy right hand, there are pleasures evermore. So watch. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and we get in the right way or we operate in the right course of life, God's way, God's plan for us, then we spend our time underneath a biblical preaching, biblical teaching, studying and rightly dividing the word of God in the presence of the Lord. Then we are able to enjoy pleasures that have enduring power. Now, God's plan for your life, pleasures that endure. Uh, this is dealing with God's will for you, and it goes back to the path of life. Gain or The word pleasure means gain or success of any kind. You know, when Jesus, as we conclude, was talking to his disciples, he gave them a great truth that they needed to heed. And it's a great truth that we disciples today need to heed. In Mark chapter number 8, starting at verse 34, and when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall save his life for my sake and the gospel's sake, the same shall save it. For what shall profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels." My dear friend, God, through his son, Jesus Christ, and salvation, and Jesus Christ is able to show you the way of life, the way to eternal life, the way from here to God, the course that you should be living on. Once again, there's a right way in your interpretation, there's a wrong way in your interpretation, and there's God's way. Secondly, the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord. Is your life being controlled and influenced by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit? Or is your life being controlled and influenced by the Antichrist spirit? 
The Antichrist spirit, you know if he's controlling you because he keeps you completely away from the things of God. That's his goal. While the Antichrist keeps you away from God, the Holy Ghost keeps you close to the things of God. And if you want to talk about pleasures that endure, God has a plan for your life. You can be successful. You can learn why you're here on earth and live out God's perfect will for you. It all starts with claiming Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, believing in his death, burial, and resurrection, and asking Jesus Christ to come into your life, forgive you of your sins, and save your soul. Isn't it about time you made that life-changing decision? Isn't it about time that you you did what you know to do, which is right? Give your life to Christ. On behalf of the Bible Baptist Church,